This is Fresh Air. I'm Terry Gross. The fabulous HBO series Succession is over, but we're just about to begin our conversation with its creator, Jesse Armstrong, who wrote a majority of the episodes, including the series finale. Also with us is Frank Rich, an executive producer of the series, who was instrumental in getting it made. Succession is about three siblings trying to succeed their elderly father, the powerful CEO of the family conglomerate. I have you beat, you morons. Those six words spoken by the patriarch Logan Roy sum up his philosophy of business and of life. I have you beat, and his opinion of his children, you morons. He's a brilliant businessman who, through power plays, manipulation, and backstabbing, has created a media and entertainment empire, including a conservative cable news network. As a father, just about any expression of love toward his children has been transactional. He's been emotionally abusive, made them dependent and weak, and condemns them for being that way. Like the father, the siblings operate free of ethical and moral concerns. For example, they seem to have succeeded in helping elect a white nationalist as president because they think he'll kill a business deal that would ruin their plans. This series is an unusual mix of drama and satire, tragedy and comedy. This interview will have spoilers, so if you're waiting to catch up on the series finale, why don't you listen later on our podcast or website? Series creator and showrunner Jesse Armstrong and executive producer Frank Rich were previously linked through the HBO satirical series about politics, Veep. Rich was an executive producer. Armstrong wrote an episode. Armstrong had previously collaborated on British comedies with the creator of Veep, Armando Iannucci. Before getting into television, Frank Rich was the New York Times chief theater critic and a columnist who wrote about the intersection of politics and pop culture. Jesse Armstrong, Frank Rich, welcome to Fresh Air. I'm so excited to talk with you. I love this series so much. I I think you probably did the right thing in ending it, but I'm so sorry it's over. Thank you, Terry. It's lovely to speak to you. Great to talk to you as always. I just want to say, it's so clever. The whole series is based on which of the siblings is going to succeed their father. And in the last episode, it's like, none of them. (laughs) So, Jesse, why couldn't any of the siblings take over? It's a good question. I guess they could do, you know, if you were thinking about this as a business situation rather than a piece of drama. Um, They might have slipped through one of them for a little while for for probably an unsatisfactory interregnum as they um, tank the share price. Um, it could have happened. They have some qualities. I don't think that they are without abilities, but they lack one thing. It's hard to work as hard as you need to work to run something like this. I think when you come from that kind of privileged background, I just think it's hard to believe that you need to stay as late, read as much and do as much work as probably necessary. At what point did you know Tom would end up being the CEO, but he'd be still a puppet? He'd be the figurehead king, and um, Madsen from Gojo would really be pulling the strings. Because Tom seemed like the most unlikely (laughs) to succeed Logan Roy. One of the things I like in the show is for things to feel natural, to feel like you could read them in the Wall Street Journal, the Financial Times, for them to feel... Um, like they fit, they're congruent with the way that we see business culture uh, and politics going. So uh, in a way, I didn't want Tom to um, take over. It became obvious or it became, yeah, it became obvious to me that he he should take over that, you know, there are a few of these, so I was about to say grayer figures, it's, that's rude to them, you know, the figures who come come through, but there were there are a few um, examples in life. There's a guy, Philippe Domont, who took over from Sumner Redstone when um, when Shari was also trying to take over in the the Viacom um, uh, CBS empire, he rather floated up and made himself very amenable to power. And and on the bigger level, we try to take from all kinds of historical moments. I guess I also thought a little bit about um, Stalin coming through the middle after Lenin's death, and there being much more um, glamorous intellectual candidates, Trotsky and Zinoviev around, but. Stalin, you know, arranged things, arranged things, arranged things, and then slipped through the middle. Um, So, yeah, there was a bunch of uh, historical and business parallels that started to seem like they were pointing in Tom's direction. Frank, what was your reaction when Jesse said, Tom is going to be the CEO? I I can't say I was surprised. 
you know, in, in the Hollywood in the 30s, in, in the media companies that time, it was the joke that the son-in-law also rises. And, <laughs> uh, and, and so in some ways, it was completely plausible to me. So, yeah, I thought it was an exciting, creative uh, turn. Let's talk about the finale. Um, so after arguing who should succeed their father as CEO and who should they offer the board as, you know, the king – because Kendall says there can only be like one king here and it should be me. And he finally convinces his siblings it should be him. So the board is voting and Shiv holds out. She's like the decisive vote. She's holding out. The three siblings go into another room, a, a glass office. Shiv explains why she can't vote for Kendall. And this refers to something that happens in the season finale of the first season when Kendall, after a party, is driving one of the caterers to score some drugs because the caterer knows, has connections. Um, Kendall's at the wheel. He's not used to a stick shift. He's not used to driving because he has a chauffeur. And he drives off the road into the river, gets himself out of the car, but the caterer drowns. And his father covers it up so no one ever knows. So here's Shiv explaining why she can't vote for Kendall to be CEO. You can't be CEO. You can't, because you killed someone. What you, but, but which? What? Wait, what which? Do you mean? Wh- which? What, like, what, like you killed so many people you forgot which one? That's, that, that, that's not an issue. That didn't happen. Wait, uh, it didn't, it's, as it, in that, what? It's, it's, uh, just, what it's just a thing I said. It's a thing I said. I made it up. You made it up. Yeah, I, 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 it was a difficult time for us, and I think I... You know, whatever, must have something from nothing because I, I just, I wanted for us all to bond at a difficult moment. Wait, it was a move? Oh. No, no, not, there, were, okay. there was a kid, there was that kid. But so there was like, a kid. I had like a toke and a beer and not, I, I didn't even get in the car. It's not. Hold on. What the fuck? I felt bad and I, I false memoried it. Like I'm, I'm totally clean. I can do this. Wait, did it happen or did it not happen? It did not happen. Uh, uh, it did not uh, happen. I wasn't even there. It did not happen dude vote for me just please vote for me shiv vote for me no yes no. shiv don't do this no. you can't do this no, shiv. no. absolutely yes. no. not man no. absolutely not no why no why what just i love you i really i love you but i can't f-ing stomach you All right, that was Jeremy Strong as Kendall, Karen Culkin as Roman, and Sarah Snook as Shiv. Now, Kendall is thwarted. Every time he tries to outdo his father or create a hostile takeover or create any kind of deal inside Waystar, Royco, or outside of it, um, he's always thwarted. It never works out. And every time you think, oh, he's growing a conscience, he's getting smarter, He's not, <laughs> you know, and like this scene that we just heard where he says, the accident never happened. I made it up. It was a false memory. Nothing happened. That's crazy. That's absolutely crazy. Why not let him grow? And I'd like you both to respond to that. It's not that I don't think people are capable of change or, or growth. I would say they happen rarely slowly and not necessarily all in one direction in that you're just as likely to devolve as evolve. Um, There's a, there's a sort of um, sense about um, narrative, especially screenplay, that that's what happens in a script that people grow, they learn. And that is the shape of a script, but that isn't the story of this show. That doesn't seem to be the truth of these people. And so we had to find story shapes, which didn't follow that particular shape. Frank, as Jesse said, it's a typical narrative thing. We watch characters grow and change through a narrative, and I think that's very true in a lot of theater. You used to be a theater critic. So what do you think of this idea that one of the main characters, Kendall, is he's just incapable of really changing or of learning? Take American drama. Um, Willie Loman, Long Day's Journey, and Death of Salesman. You look at the Glass Menagerie, Amanda. These characters are tragic, and there's a degree of tragedy to Kendall 
and they don't change. You know, Willie Loman in Death of a Salesman still believes in a, you know, a, a shoeshine and a smile and, the, and the, the, the great American idea that you can sell anything in advance through doing it. I fundamentally believe that, that people don't change that much in real life. Uh, some people do, sure, but a lot of people don't, including a lot of people I just know in real life. People are who they are, and a lot of people, particularly people who want power, whether it be economic or political power, keep doing the same things. And and certainly it's true in the arena where we set our show. It's not like Murdoch has ever changed or Sumner Redstone ever changed in terms of how they operate as people. Okay, let's talk about the final shots of um, this the series finale of Succession. I want to start with Shiv. So Shiv is in the limo with her previously estranged husband, Tom, who has become the victor. He's the new CEO. And he's looking as powerful and as regal as he can muster. And he holds out his hand without even looking at her as a sign of his power, not of a sign as, uh, of love. But it's like, I am the king. Here is my hand. <laughs> and she kind of reluctantly takes it. It's a loveless marriage at this point. In some ways, she's made herself a prisoner because instead of being the daughter of, now she's the wife of. She gets to maintain a connection to the family conglomerate, but she's in a pretty diminished role as the wife. Like, how do you see her at the end? As a prisoner who has weakened her position or as somebody who's using all of her smarts to still have access to power? It's a great question. I used to feel really um, reluctant to talk about these things uh, like I was going to be imposing um, uh, the answer onto things which I would, you know, delight in finding open for the audience to make their own interpretations on. Now that the whole show is finished, I feel like, well, there it is. And people can take a view and, and my view is only one and everyone has their own view. And um, I can tell you mine, which is for me, it was a moment of equality, chilly, rather terrifying equality, but equality, which has never been the case in that relationship before Tom has always been subservient. Now he has this status, but his status is contingent. We've, that's kind of what the whole episode has been about. Um, Shiv's status is, as all the kids are, you know, secure. It's secure in a financial sense. She has billions of dollars that she has wealth that could never, could never diminish, um, whatever happened to the world. And she also has a name which will sort of haunt her and, um, make her interesting to a certain degree for the rest of her life. Uh, and that can't be taken away from her, whereas Tom's position could be taken away in the in the click of her fingers. Um, so th- for me, there's a very terrifying equality in that a remarkable dry hand on hand. It's not really even human contact. It's a sort of two pieces of porcelain or something. So that's what it is for me. That isn't what it'd be for everyone. Frank, how did you feel about that ending for Shiv and your interpretation of it? I'm fascinated to hear uh, Jesse uh, come clean about it. Um, I guess I experienced it as very transitional and very emotional. I felt that she was in some ways in emotional shock. When you look at the rapid fire of truly traumatic uh, confrontations and events and uh, the changing over the business and all of that in a very compressed period of time, I just can't imagine when she's been through that with Kendall and she's been through that with the company that she wanted to take over and she's been through everything with her husband that she has a clear direction. It would almost be weird if she did. And so she's in the moment sort of, but there's a kind of numbness. Part of this to me comes from Sarah's performance. It's almost like she's been traumatized, not maybe in the clinical sense, but just She's in limbo, and I love the fact that it ends with that ambiguity. We don't know what's going to happen to them. So let's talk about, like, Roman ends drinking what I think is a martini alone at a bar after saying, we're all BS. It's all nothing. Jesse, why did you place him at the bar? What does that say to you about Roman in the moment and in the future? Yeah, I, I think um, the, the three scenes are very interesting in terms of the way that we work in that one of them, the uh, Tom and Shit, is rather precisely as scripted, I think, um, 
uh, the piece in the bar is was there was more to it, a little bit more dialogue. But I think when we were in the edit, um, Roman's face, Kieran's face was so eloquent that we just used the rather extraordinary set of expressions. And uh, Kieran's character, Roman, he ends up most particularly exactly where he started, which is living the life of a sort of sad playboy, I guess, and um, uh, sipping a drink, which people might associate with his quasi love of his life, uh, Jerry, she, who we've often seen sipping a martini. So, um, yeah. So Kendall ends up broken. He's lost his wife. He's lost his children. He's lost the company. He has no idea who he is. He's always wanted to like best his father. His father's dead. He sees no other options for himself. So it ends with him sitting on a bench and staring at the Hudson River. And water often means really bad things for Kendall, the car accident, the drowning of the waiter, suicidal thinking. Did you know all along that the theme of water would also play out in the final scene? It ends the first season with the drowning and it ends the last season. Water is such a powerful symbol in the series. And Jesse, I'd also like to know, do you think that Kendall at that point is thinking of jumping in to the river? Oh, such a fascinating, knotty uh, question. To answer a couple of things, I guess water can also mean baptism and, you know, um, cleansing and ablution and, um, you know, a fun, so swim. It's yeah. mm. a fun swim, yeah, and splashing in the pool. And we've occasionally seen it used that way. It's developed. There was no no sort of image structure that was formulaically laid down at the beginning of the show that this is how it, it's something that developed and we found. And and then once again, actually, the, the scripted version of that scene ended. The gut punch, which occurred to me, was the revelation of Colin, Logan's old bodyguard, who is the repository for some of the, you know, the bad act that you've talked about. He, he knows about them. And so his presence stood in for history, his Kendall's particular, you know, history and his history in the company. Um, and it was the genius of Mark Mylod and the camera operators and Jeremy that took us right down to the tip of Battery Park to the tip of Manhattan and looking out to Ellis Island and, and, um, the Statue of Liberty and this, you get, you know, if it was Freud in it, it'd be overdetermined to this sort of, there's the water and there's the US and there's the, Wall Street, and there's potentially a lot going on there, or there's just a guy sitting on a park bench as well in the freezing cold, I might add. But um, we found quite a lot of that stuff on the day through the great flexibility of this extraordinary cast and crew. Do you think he's contemplating ending his life? For me, Kendall, at the end, one of the things he lacks is even the freedom to determine his own course through life, the, the name and the wealth around him, you know, to lots of us, obviously, it seems extraordinarily fortunate, and it is. But I do believe there is a certain kind of tragedy to a royal name, to being a Disney or a Windsor or, or any of those kind of names. And he can never, ever escape that. And, um, and one of the ways he can't escape that is to have a bubble of protection around him and a bubble of protection of money and human beings. In this case, he's got his dad's bodyguard right there with him. So even if he is contemplating it, I don't think it could ever happen to him. And yeah, for me, that's not the way the story goes for this kind of person. Yeah, uh, my understanding is that uh, Jeremy Strong improvised a take in which he climbs over the railing from the pedestrian side of the river to the river side and looking as if he's r really maybe about to jump in and his bodyguard like runs over to prevent that from happening. Um, and that that was improvised. Were you there when Jeremy Strong improvised that? Sure. Yeah, we were there. It's biting cold and we were, you know, I'm there every day and um, it's certainly for that important scene. Uh, what do you think? Uh, I was terrified. I was terrified that he might fall in and be injured. It didn't look like he was going to jump in, but it once he climbed over that barrier, you know, when you film, there are generally a lot of health and safety assessments made. And that was not our plan that day. And normally I know that if we'd if we'd even been thinking of that happening, we would have had boats and frogmen and all kinds of uh, safety measures, which we didn't have. So my first thought was for his physical safety as a 
human being, not anything about the character. Yeah, so that's what I felt on the day. <laughs> Good Lord above. It was like breaking a barrier, like walking through the fourth wall, and it was bitterly cold on top of it. Also, everyone was eager for the cold reasons and also for scheduling reasons involving subsequent production to be done with it. And um, and, I th- and I think uh, Scott Nicholson, who, who played Kyle, was also somewhat alarmed and, and was functioning as a person as much as a character in that moment. Succession is this very hard to describe, at least I find it hard to describe, mix of satire and drama and tragedy. And I confess, the first time I watched it, the season premiere, I tuned out in the middle. I thought, these are hateful people. And then I heard other people talking about Succession, and I thought, like, gee, it sounds really interesting. So I went back and got immediately hooked. Um, But I had no idea that there were comedic elements. Now, maybe that's on me, but I know other people who felt that way, too. And I'm wondering, did you want to kind of sneakily (laughs) bring in the comedy slowly uh, and not kind of announce itself, you know, right away? Yeah, would that I had that much control over my own writing. In a way, (laughs) the, the, the tone of the show is kind of how I write. Um, so I guess one of the things I was curious about was showing the ludicrous, the comic, the incongruous, the gross um, parts of these gilded lives. Um, and so maybe that's where the impulse to make sure that there was comedy in there came from, because that's a good register to to try and approach some of that stuff. Your, your background was in comedy and satire. Oh, yeah. I'm, I'm a comedy writer. I'd still, I guess, maybe really call myself a comedy writer. I'd written, you know, with my long-term writing partner, Sam Bain, nine series of Peep Show, which is a sitcom in the UK. Uh, I'd barely, I'd done one Black Mirror that was also vaguely comic. I think I'd, I'd hardly done anything that wasn't comic, wholly comic before this show. Some of the funniest parts of Succession are the insults. I mean, there's web pages with just like lists of the best insults from the series. Lots of them have obscenities that we cannot broadcast. But there's one long insult I love that, Jesse, you wrote. It's after Logan dies, when Tom shares his hopes of becoming the CEO with Carl, the chief financial officer of Waystar Royco, and Carl explains why that's never going to happen. So um, I want to play that clip. It starts with Tom. Were the opportunity to arise, all I would say is that if there's a ring, my hat's in, respectfully. Well, I would just say, um, if we were to recommend you to the board, mm-hmm. the question they might ask, can, can, can I frame the question for you, but as a friend, sure. just so, so you'd be, sure. be prepared. The negative case would go, you're a clumsy interloper and no one trusts you. The only guy pulling for you is dead. And now you're just married to the ex-boss's daughter <laughs> And she doesn't even like you. And you are fair and squarely. Jesus, Carl. (laughs) That's Matthew McFadden as Tom. And that was David Rashi as Carl. Um, So I was sure Tom was a fool to think he'd be CEO. Little did I know. Um, But what are some of your favorite insults from the series? You could just say bleep in the parts that are too obscene to um, to say on the air. I, the only thing I guess I sometimes think about the insults, there's two skills that different people in the room have to different degrees. I think we can all do all of them, but I sometimes think of it as being like nest building and egg laying. And, and sometimes the craft is to create the nest, you know, in that case, uh, the setup, which is the disingenuous offer by Carl to offer a frank assessment of of Tom's position as a friend, so you sort of lay <laughs> as a friend, as a friend, <laughs> and you you build that nest, and then in a way, it can be a different job to lay the egg into that nest. And I think I can do both, and so are most of my fellow writers. But sometimes they're slightly different crafts, and we also have the opportunity because we have quite a flexible shooting style to um, to lay quite a lot of eggs and see how they fit in those little nests. We didn't in that case, it was just that piece. But, um, but you know, that's one of the reasons maybe we have some good material in our 
um, insulting lines because they are particularly good opportunities to to try out a, a number of different options and see which one usually not necessarily is just the most brutal, but is the most characterful and true. Let's take a short break here and then we'll talk some more. We're talking about HBO's Succession, which had its series finale Memorial Day weekend. My guests are Jesse Armstrong, the creator, showrunner, and chief writer of the series, and Frank Rich, an executive producer of the show. We'll talk more after a break. I'm Terry Gross, and this is Fresh Air. Let's get back to my interview about the HBO series Succession. The finale ran on Memorial Day weekend, and we finally found out if any of the siblings were able to succeed their father, Logan Roy, as the CEO of the family media and entertainment empire. My guests are Jesse Armstrong, the series creator, showrunner, and head writer, and Frank Rich, an executive producer of the show. Rich was also an executive producer of the HBO series Veep. Before Rich got into television, he worked at the New York Times as its chief theater critic and a columnist covering the intersection of politics and culture. The siblings have committed a lot of offenses. They they have no moral center. They'll do anything to win, like their father. And I think like their worst offense is calling the election at the family conservative cable news network in favor of the white nationalist candidate. And they're doing this just because they think the white nationalist candidate is going to stop an unfavorable business deal that would end up with their company getting taken over. Um, So that is really quite a major event. But the election isn't decided yet when the series ends because there was a fire in Milwaukee and ballots were burned and these were ballots likely to be Democratic um, so why did you want to end the series without the election actually being resolved? And th- there's going to be lawsuits. You know, it's going to be dragged out probably. Yeah, I wrestled with this one quite a lot. I n- always knew that I wanted to have an election during the um, show because we've seen these characters and we're interested in their psychology. Hopefully, I certainly am. And that's one strand of the show. But uh, you know, I don't think we'd be interested in them if they, you know, ran a wallpaper factory. It's because of their influence through the media that they are, are fascinating to me. And so I wanted to show that at its, you know, most important moment. And, um, but I also felt, especially as a British person, um, that it wasn't appropriate for the show to declare on what on what even in our fictional world we think is going to be the fate of the Republic. Um, so it was important to me that we left it where, where it would be. And we worked with um, very skilled um, political operatives to figure out the the right configuration of story that would both put ATN, the, their news organization in a, in a powerful position to affect things, but also would leave things poised because yeah, it, some people found the episode I know sort of um, gut wrenching and traumatic, and I can imagine because it's a very serious time for America. And um, yeah, I didn't feel it was appropriate for us to say which way we think things will go. Um, so that's why we left it poised. One other thing that, which is, what if we had called the election one? What if we had said Mencken won or or Mencken lost? I think if we if if he lost, it would have been saccharine and sort of made us look like we're resolving this great crisis that's ongoing uh, in in American democracy is going to certainly continue at full force through the twenty four election at least. Um, and it would have it would have been I don't know it would have been saccharine. And if he won, it would have been melodramatic in in the in another direction. And 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 I think kind of. Uh, glib and uh, almost a form of slo- political sloganeering or ideological. Uh, so I, th- I think it was, it would have rung false if we had called it. And I like that we left it where we did. Yeah, I, 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 that makes sense to me. I just want to mention one line when uh, Connor, who's running for president as a libertarian, only because he has the money to do it, he has like no support. He's you know a totally insignificant character in the election, but he says, it makes an election so much more interesting to be in it. <laughs> He's such a dilettante. I love that line. Did, did you write that, Jesse? Yeah, it seemed true to me. It would be more fun, wouldn't they, the election, if you had a little bit more skin in the game? Yeah, it's absolutely not a reason to run. 
Um, Jesse, I want to ask you about the writing that we don't get to hear, and that is the stage directions. Do you write stage directions in your scripts? Yeah. I've seen people who write more, and I've seen people who write less. Um, so, yeah, we have stage directions. We've recently published the scripts, and they're, the, they're not transcripts. They're the actual shooting scripts. So if people are curious about what we say and what what we shoot according to that, they can compare and contrast. Can one of you give us an example or two of stage directions that you think were really helpful clues for the actors? Hmm, that's a good one. I can't, I'm can't. i terrible at remembering. I do know that since we were talking about it that um, Matthew found it interesting or helpful. I think it says that um, him and Shiver, two bombs in their silos waiting to be delivered in that car, uh, and he found that a useful image to carry. Jesse, you worked for a member of parliament before getting into television. What was your job? And what are some of the stories or insights that you got from being in politics or adjacent to politics that you were able to uh, use as insights for succession? I guess I got um, a sense of proximity to power, which I'd grown up a long way away from. And so that intangible sense of what power feels like this was it was before the uh, 1997 election when Tony Blair won so it, it was proximate power and 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 I was quite far from it but um as a very very junior advisor to a junior would be minister so did you have to suck up to anybody did you become somebody's pain sponge <laughs> um did you have to um do bad things I think I was an unbelievably unsuccessful, uh, they'd call them a special advisor now, but to think of me, there was nothing much special about me and my advice would have been very poor. I was I was an outsider. I was helping write letters, occasionally a speech and uh, think about some policy or write something. But I was, I was far outside the loop and I was not good at doing what would have been useful to my boss, which would have been burrowing into the networks of, of friendship and um, connection that would have allowed him to get an extra margin or an extra piece of information. I wasn't a very good politician or even an aide to a politician, um, but it was fascinating to see that world. But you're a good observer. Um, I guess. Your father was a teacher who became a crime novelist in the 90s. Can you briefly describe the style of writing in his books and what they exposed you to, both in terms of crime, but also in terms of narrative and withholding information so that the reader has to try to guess what the mystery is or who did the crime or how it's going to play out. Yeah, my dad was a teacher and he'd actually taught me English at what we call A-level in English between 16 and 18. And he was a good teacher, I think. And he exposed us to a wide variety of um, literature and poems. And that's always been important to me. And, you know, I can be something of a magpie and um, I like to take bits and pieces from from everywhere and turn them into elements of scenes or scenes. Um, and as a novelist, I guess I, I got a sense, you know, my mum's family was a big storytelling family as well. Her father was a um, Royal Navy um, sailor and uh, he told a good tale. Um, so there was lots of storytelling in my family. In terms of my dad's books, they are crime novels. I think he was probably, he would say, always more interested in the writing than the crime. And I guess I got a kind of close attention to prose style and thinking about what you're doing with language more than the narrative tricks or scaffolding that you have to put in place for something like a crime novel. Frank, your father was a lawyer who also worked as a lobbyist. Are there things that you were able to draw on? This is your stepfather, actually. Exactly. Yeah, um, yeah my stepfather was, was a, a, a lawyer with a small firm, would later be called like a K Street lawyer. In fact, it literally was on K Street. And he was a fixer. He did somewhat uh, dubious, I'm um, surely, surely dubious uh, favors, uh, manipulating things in federal agencies, regulatory agencies, and so on for corporations, in his case, particularly international airlines. And I grew up uh, around, I grew up in the city of D.C., and I saw the sleaze at, at work. And, you know, and he dealt with, he was a, he was a tertiary figure at best, but he did deal with um, everyone from Lyndon Johnson when he was vice president and, 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 uh, Justice Douglas in the Supreme Court and Abe Fortas on the Supreme Court and uh, Drew Pearson, the the uh, supposedly muckraking uh, political uh, columnist, 
And so you really, I really saw as a kid, and really as a kid, not being very sophisticated, how the sausage was made. And I feel we've we captured that. Uh, we captured some of it in Veep too, but we captured it in a more brutal way in the political story um, in Succession. And it never changes. You know, it was true in the 19th century too. But um, uh, so that had an enormous impact on how I view these things and the lens, I guess, which is somewhat cynical, with which I view politics in general. I, I regret to say that, uh, Frank, we have to let you go because you're in a New York studio and our studio time is up. Um, Frank Rich is an executive producer of Succession. What a wonderful series. Thank you for it. And thank you for coming on our show and talking. Great to talk to you as always. Thanks. Why don't we take a short break here and then we'll talk some more. So my guest is Jesse Armstrong and we'll talk more about creating and writing Succession after we take a short break. This is Fresh Air. This message comes from NPR sponsor, Sierra Nevada Brewing Company. Director of Sustainability Mandy McKay shares one of the many ways their team is thinking about how sustainable brewing practices also help make operations more efficient. We earned platinum zero waste certification back in 2013, and that means we're diverting 99.8% of our waste from the landfill. And most of that is through recycling, composting, um, or reuse. We own the only hot rot composting system in the entire country, and it's there to compost all of our food waste and some of our spent brewing materials on site. We turn it into compost, and then we use that compost on our estate garden, which grows food for the restaurant, and our hop and barley fields nearby. So we just took it upon ourselves to to do that, do it ourselves, and keep that organic material out of the landfill, turn it into something we can use, and close that loop. Learn more by visiting sierranevada.com. Must be 21 or older. Please drink responsibly. Let's get back to my interview with Jesse Armstrong, the creator, showrunner, and chief writer of the HBO series Succession, which ended Memorial Day weekend. Jesse, when we first see Logan on the first episode of the series, it's his 80th birthday, and he's very weak. The first time we see him, he gets out of bed in the morning. He's breathing heavily. He's walking with difficulty. He goes to the bathroom to pee, and because he's so disoriented, he pees on the bathroom rug. And not long after this, he has um, like a, a bleed in the brain, a stroke, an embolism. I, I'm, I'm a little unclear exactly what it is, but you know he becomes exceptionally weakened. It's unlike it seems unlikely he'll even pe- pull through, but but he does. Um, why did you want to in- introduce this very powerful, domineering, manipulative man in such a vulnerable state the first time we see him? Yeah, I guess that's. Um well, I think the show hopefully is about a bunch of different things, but it's definitely very concerned with mortality. Um, and people will know that Rupert Murdoch and Sumner Redstone have of, often made the same quip about their succession, saying that they wanted to um, not die. That would that was their succession plan. And I, I, it always struck me that um, none of us really want to die, do we? And the the feeling of having a very full diary of having another deal ready to go of having another pressing meeting with your lawyers is a very powerful way to stop feeling um the 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 um the reaper is at the door so mortality was sort of coded in from the very beginning and the way that um these endeavors might be a way of keeping oneself from thinking about it the series begins and ends for logan roy in the bathroom you know he, he goes to the bathroom the first time we see him and pees on the rug, he misses the toilet, and then he dies on his jet in the bathroom. Um, so that seems to be a motif, <laughs> Logan in the bathroom. Um, why? Yeah, and I know I now remember that in the end of the first season, is he get he gets the news, he gets a bear hug letter from from his son, also in a bathroom, and he throws it into the into the toilet bowl. Um, so yeah, I guess one thing is that comedy often works better in small spaces, and so uh, if a scene isn't working, um, it's not worth. It's sometimes worth trying putting it in a smaller space and seeing what happens when people have to be in each other's physicality. Um, 
uh, apart from that, I guess there is something about, you know, maybe it's something childish about seeing kings and queens on the toilet. That's what you're, you know, in, in the UK, it was meant to be a hard thing to imagine the queen, uh, the late queen uh, being on the toilet. And uh, there, I guess there's maybe something childlike about seeing great figures doing what all of us must do. You have like unique writing styles for each of the siblings and for Logan Roy. Can you talk a little bit about coming up with with each of their voices? I guess a couple of overall things are that it, it struck me that powerful people often don't say so much, and and Logan is says probably many fewer words than than his less powerful um, colleagues and um, people who surround him. Indeed, it's probably true that the people with the least power speak the most when you think about. Tom, uh, uh, before he assumed power, and Greg, that they have these great torrents of words because they're trying to fill in the holes and equivocate and um, countermand what they've just said to, to precisely express themselves because they're worried that power is going to take a, a dim view of them. So there's something about literally the quantity of words that you speak and also the volume. You know, power can often be very quiet and make you lean in until it explodes and makes you lean out. Um, I guess Kendall has, we hear him first um, listening to rap music and he has a desire to hit a sort of colloquial, um, but buzzword infused. He, I think he likes language. I think he wants to use interesting language. He's not a terrible performer, you know, even, um, some people find his rap utterly risible. I find it comic, but also not bad. Uh, and so he, he, I think he has a certain verbal felicity, a certain verbal interest, and sometimes that goes over the edge into being um, ludicrous. Uh, Shiv, her tragedy has been that she uh, has um, sought to modulate her every performance, her performance in the in the sense of what she's doing in the world to to keep her options open. And so there's a sense in which she does that verbally as well. Um, Robin is explosive and the most um, close to being a truth teller in that kind of jester role where he can say the unsayable and then claim that he didn't say it or didn't mean it. And he and people, it's a very powerful position once you start to be able to say, I didn't mean it after everything, every true thing that you say. And Greg has this like cluelessness and formality when he's on the witness stand during the hearings about the way Stara Cruz's um, cruise line sexual harassment scandal. He's questioned by a senator, and <laughs> and he says Greg's answer is, "If it is so, be said, so be it." It if it is to be said, so it is. I think or something. Yeah. Yeah. If it um, is to be said. So be it. And and the the senator said, what is that? You can speak normal. And Greg says, I shall. <laughs> uh, so you created this kind of like really strange formality for him. Yeah, I think there's a little bit of the kind of um, 18th century in there, that sort of courtier vibe and the uh, yeah hyper Why? verbosity. Why? But well, I think there's also a class thing there, which is, you know, the, the phrase hypercorrection, where people who are outside their normal class or social um, arena sometimes end up being idiotic because they're trying to be too proper. You know, it happens when in, in our English class a bit obsessed society when people try to change their vocal pitch and nature to try and fit in with posher people um, and you hypercorrect and then you become ludicrous by throwing in those extra words or reversing the order and um, doing things which you think sound like they might have a formality which is appropriate but ends up being nonsense um, so it's 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 a it's a it's a very nice thing in life to be comfortable with how you speak. Um, and there's some the show talks a little bit about how comfortable uh, Logan is uh, at a certain point in the season. Logan basically has a, a, a catchphrase, which is "f off." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's succinct. Per power is succinct. Uh, yes. <laughs> Why don't we take a short break here, and then we'll talk some more. So my guest is Jesse Armstrong. And we'll talk more about creating and writing succession after we take a short break. This is Fresh Air. So let's listen to the goodbye scene when Logan Roy is on his jet and he's either dying or dead. People on the jet are trying to revive him, 
but it doesn't seem to be working. The kids are on a, a, a cruise ship celebrating um, Connor's wedding. And so they get this call, like, your father's dying. Tom's on the phone telling them. And they don't know what's going on. So Tom gives the phone, puts the phone to Logan's ear so that they could say their goodbyes. And they don't know if he's dead or if he's alive. They don't know if he can hear them. So I want to play um, the goodbyes. And the order we'll hear is first Kieran Culkin as uh, Roman and Jeremy Strong as Kendall and Sarah Snook as Shiv. So um, let's start with Roman. Um, hey, Dad. Uh, uh, I hope you're okay. Uh, you're okay. You're you're going to be okay. Uh, because you're you're a monster, and you're gonna win. Cause you just you just win, and uh, you're a good you're a good man. You're a good dad. You're a very very good dad. Uh, you did a good job. No, I don't, I'm sorry, I don't know how to do that. You can, I can't, you, your turn. Am I by his ear? Yeah. You're by his ear, if he can, if he can hear, he can hear you. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, hang in there. Yeah, um. Be okay. It'll be okay. I know, we love you, Dad. Okay, we love you. I love you, Dad. I do. I love you. Okay. I can't. I can't forgive you. Um, but uh, yeah. But I. I. I uh, it's okay. Um, and 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 I love you. Uh, so that was Karen Culkin as uh, Roman and Jeremy Strong as Kendall, and here Sarah Snook saying her goodbye as Shiv. Uh, Dad? Um, hey. Dad? Daddy? Uh, I love you. Uh, uh, don't go, please, not now. No, I, I, uh, I, I, I love you. you, you God, I don't know. Um, there's no excuses for me, but I. And it's okay. It's okay, Daddy. It's okay. I love you. Those are really amazing performances and and, and incredible writing too. And I I think Jesse, you you wrote that scene. Um, have you ever been in a position like that? of saying your goodbye on the phone while somebody on the other end held the phone to the dying person's ear? No, honestly, I, I haven't. Um, I've known sad things and I've known people who've suffered sad things and people who are generous in the writer's room sharing mm -hmm. thoughts about those areas, um, things they knew, things they, they had experienced and other people they knew had experienced. So... Um, I don't believe you have to have been through something like that precisely to um, be able to write it. You can, the terrible thing we imagine in the future is, is can be as vivid as the thing we've experienced. Um, so no, I haven't, but there is something about the modern era, which is that often sad, bad news comes in, comes at us like that from nowhere and hits us from nowhere. And so that occurred to us as, as as a way that modern sadnesses often happen in this light, rather disembodied way, and then you're left in a in nowhere state where um, you're physically disconnected from the events. Well, you really captured the not knowing what to say aspect in a situation like that. You know, not knowing how to say goodbye, but especially in a conflicted relationship like the siblings had with their father, where they loved him and they hated him. And sometimes the hate would really overpower the love. Um, and Kendall even says, I can't forgive you. I love you. Um, so can you talk a little bit about writing those goodbyes, like what you wanted to capture and the language and the stammering that you created? 
Yeah, and it's a, obviously the whole show is such a multiple collaborations, but I feel especially in those moments they could be they could lie on the page inert if it wasn't with those brilliant actors doing them, doing the the scene. Um, it, I, I'm a I'm a rewriter. I rewrite a lot. We rework the scripts a lot through production, um, and it can be sometimes be hard for the actors as we change things, but that episode and especially that long stretch in the middle I didn't I um I wrote it relatively quickly and then I tried to be very careful about what I revised because I don't often feel this but it felt like it had a in its it had a coherence in its incoherence that were felt appropriate and um I wanted to leave it rather raw you know hopefully our insults and our verbal attacks are believable and characterful, but they're often more carefully wrought and um, multiple claws and um, Baroque and the simplicity of the language, the mixture of truth and untruth, the, you know, feeling towards the edge of language and what it, what, what it can express all felt um, good in the, early, early drafts. And I therefore tried not to change it. And I tried not to change the last things that Logan said once I sort of knew that they were the last things that Logan said, because I didn't want them to have the form of a, you know, of a, a grandiloquent kind of um, moment of speech, because that didn't seem appropriate that the show isn't, isn't constructed in that way. It tries to, you know, in its artificial way, it tries to recreate reality. And um, it seemed to, uh, it seemed to be appropriate not to retouch those moments because, you know, he didn't know he was going to die. <laughs> he didn't know he was going to die. So it felt appropriate for me not to, to, to try to remember, <laughs> to forget that as well. Do you remember what those last lines were? Uh, I think he's saying something about let's um, refocus, let's get a bit more aggressive, probably with a couple of curse words in there, but um, they're typical of his, of, of him, but they, they're not the summation that you might have um, put in his mouth if you were doing a more classical ending or death speech. So I, I, I want to ask you about obscenities, particularly when it applies to insults. Their series is so laced with obscenities, and they're very colorful, and the insults are hilarious. They add color, but can, can you talk about the advantage of using that many obscenities from a writer's point of view? <laughs> yeah, obscenities, I guess there, there's, there's obscenities, and then there's the invective and the insults. Certain worlds, construction sites, and high pressure environments, newsrooms, certain places have quite a lot of swearing in my experience. And that's just trying to be reflective of how some people speak to each other, especially brutalized people and people who don't mind brutalizing each other. Um, large organizations often take on the character of the people at the top and it, it permeates all the way through the organizations. And this is a horrible world as i said somewhere in this season the poison does drip down through this organization and into the world i really regret to say that we are out of time it has been such a pleasure to talk with you thank you so much for talking about succession and thank you for creating it it's given me and so many other people so much pleasure Thank you, Terry. It's lovely to speak to you. Great questions. I feel like I've managed to say things that I knew I thought, but had never really expressed before. So it's um, thanks for the um, opportunity to chat to you. Jesse Armstrong is the creator, showrunner, and head writer of HBO's Succession. Fresh Air's executive producer is Danny Miller. Our technical director and engineer is Audrey Bentham. Our senior producer today is Roberta Shorrock. Our interviews and reviews are produced and edited by Amy Sallett, Phyllis Myers, Sam Brigger, Lauren Krenzel, Heidi Simon, Teresa Madden, Henry Boldonado, Seth Kelly, and Susan Yakundi. Our digital media producer is Molly C.V. Nesper. Thea Chaloner directed today's show. I'm Terry Gross.